Would you please rise? Thank you. Please be seated. We're here to celebrate the life of Brenda Fisher, and God speaks always words of life for us in sacred times like this. We're glad you're here. Uh, you will know in the very beginning that Brenda designed this service. She shared with great faith in these last days what she wanted to see. So all the words, all the songs, all the things we're doing are things she said, I want them to hear that about uh, her faith life, and God will speak to us very clearly as we hear the words, sing the songs, hear the prayers. God's very real. So as we gather in this uh, very sacred gathering to celebrate someone's life of great significance, uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we're before you as your children, and we want to trust you like children. We know in this loss, there's great sadness here in this place. Now, we're going to miss Brenda greatly. She lived a great life. We celebrate the memories that we have together of who she was, how she shared, how she gave, how she loved, how she made a difference. We're glad she's left a gap because she has left a gap in our lives and our hearts in this world today. But God, now we look to you in words of faith. Uh, we'll share her with songs of faith. We'll speak words of faith. We'll pray prayers of faith. And we ask the Lord to be real to us as you were in her life. We know she shared that in all the ways she knew how, and now we want to celebrate the faith she had, that your promise is real, that there's a place in heaven where she is today, and we can share in that good news moment as we look to you. So once again, Lord, we ask you to warm our hearts. Uh, be the comforter to us to know that you are here, uh, that we speak words of life, not words of death. We speak words of light, not of darkness. We talk about new beginnings, not endings, as we share memories, share words that matter to us, and as always, through faith in Christ, we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Ave Maria, great song that she loved.
Thank you for that, Ms. Harder. That was really nice. Uh, my name is Keith Jones. I uh, know most of you, but some of you I do not. I grew up across the street from Brenda, and I loved her and admired her all my life. Brenda was kind and sweet and gentle and loving, and she possessed a very quiet strength that got her through some tough times. Brenda called me in early September and informed me that she had been in the hospital, but that she was home and she was doing well and uh, things were good. A few days later, Tony Lee called me and said, Brenda's back in the hospital and you and Calvin need to come see her. So we went with my wife, Laura, and we walked into the hospital room and I was expecting the worst and Brenda was sitting up and she was talking and she was laughing and we had a good time and we were there for over an hour and we had a good visit. And when we left there, I thought, well, we're gonna have her for a long time. Things are good. On September the 21st, she texted and asked if I would speak at her funeral about our early days in Mark at 1301 and 1302 McLennan. I texted her back and I said I could do that, but it would be very hard. And she texted me and said, I know it would be hard, but we would appreciate it. On Tuesday, September the 27th at 6.12 p.m., I was overcome with a profound sense that I needed to get in touch with Brenda. And I sent her a text and I said, hey, how's your week going? And she had been gone from us for about eight minutes. Now, I don't call that coincidence. I call that love and whatever else you want to call into that. But she asked me to talk about the early years in Mark, so let's do what she asked. The McClennan story really began in March of, of May of 1945 when World War II ended in Europe. Tony had fought in Germany. My dad had fought in the Pacific. Actually, if you talk to my dad, he'll tell you that Tony crawled across most of Germany with a rifle in his hand. And my dad played ping pong on an Army Air Corps base in Taklov and Leyte, the Philippines. But after the war, they both ended up in Mark, became best friends, got married to the love of their lives, started having babies. Brenda was born on December the 19th, 1947, and she was one of the first baby boomers born in Mark. Linda Lou, you were probably a little ahead of her. Maybe David Bird, but I don't know anybody else it was. We had an idyllic life in Mark. We, uh, the Joneses and the Waylands spent a lot of time together. We vacationed together in Colorado. I saw my first mountain on that trip. Um, Daddy and Tony found a, a trampoline court that we went to and jumped on. Um, it was just a it was a beautiful, idyllic life. Brenda was beautiful. If you don't believe it, look at that picture. She was loving, she was kind, and she had a quiet strength that got her through a lot of hard times. I don't ever remember Brenda Whalen raising her voice. In my whole life, Tony, I can't say that about you. <laughs> I, you know, I watched Brenda grow up from the eyes of a little guy, six, seven, eight years old. When two of the prettiest girls in Mark live across the street from you, there are always a lot of boys coming and going. And Calvin and I used to hang out in that front yard and kind of hoping that maybe one of those older Mark Panthers would throw us the football or something. There were literally guys showing up over there in white sport coats and pink carnations, going on dates. And back then a date was a hamburger at the Triple X and maybe a few trips up and down Texas Avenue. We had some great football games in that front yard, and that front yard probably did as much to develop good football players as any yard in town. Tony wouldn't let Onita plant any trees because he didn't want to mess up our gridiron. One, one Christmas Eve, we had left First Baptist Martin. We came home, and Mother was driving. We pulled in the driveway, and I noticed some lights behind the garage that I had never noticed before. So we went over to Tony and Onita's. We had the tree, and I convinced Tony, uh, Tony Lee and Brenda and Calvin, I said, hey, we need to go check this out. So we go over there. Now, I'm a little guy. I mean, I'm, I'm still believing in Santa Claus, right? And those bicycles are standing there, and there's four brand new Western Flyers. And I looked at those bicycles, and I said, well, 
do y'all think maybe Santa Claus just dropped these off earlier and he's coming back and he's going to put them in the house? And Brenda just looked at me and warmly smiled, and Tony Lee goes, hey, dummy, there is no Santa Claus. <laughs> we, uh, we had a lot of fun. Um, uh, our parents played 42, and Louise Murphy, Ina Bird, all these different women around town, they all tried to outdo themselves with these 42 parties. But uh, they were great fun for us kids because we got to stay up late, got to have a lot of fun. We got to eat all the Jack and Jill donuts that you could in an evening. Is Jack and Jill donuts still in business in Waco? They are? Okay. Anyway, but well, we had a great life and a lot of fun, and we had homecoming parades and, of course, Mark Panther football and all of those things. But um, in, this, in 66, Brenda went off to the University of Texas, and um, it's kind of like the, the life went out of all of us for a while. Um, that same summer, we were on a trip, And we were in Washington, D.C., and they came on the radio and they said that there had been a shooting on the campus at the University of Texas and that 16 people had been killed. And we heard that on the radio, and my dad became frantic. And he, he said, you know, Brenda could have been right there. And my mother, the eternal optimist, like, well, that's a big campus. That, you know, you're making, she's fine. But we finally got to a payphone, and Daddy called, and Tony answered, and he, he was able to tell us that Brenda was okay. But... Brenda had a soft spot in my dad's heart. Later in life, Brenda came to see us in Oklahoma City, and she visited with a friend of ours, and this friend of ours had been a teacher, and she was now in pharmaceutical sales, and they had a long conversation. And I remember when, when Brenda came home from that trip, she pursued a career in pharmaceuticals, she got a job, and she killed it for many years. And then, I'm, I've got to close, but I just want to say this, that, you know, Brenda had some hard knocks in life. She had cancer, breast cancer at a very early age, and she was really, really sick. But she had a quiet strength that got her through it. And Lee, when she married you and your family, she hit a home run. And Kristen, you might be the most loved child ever. You should know that. Your mother was your rock. And she loved you with all her heart and all her soul. And so with that, I just want to say that Brenda was beautiful. She was smart. She was loving and kind. She had a quiet strength about her. And I shall miss her for the rest of my life. Thank you. need to lower this. Keith played football for Baylor. I didn't. My name is Mike Harder. I'm incredibly honored to be asked to speak to you today and thank Lee and the family for allowing me to do so. Also, you'll have to bear with me. I've written this down, my thoughts as my mother passed on the crying gene to me. And I pray I communicate how special Brendan and Lee have been in Anne's and my life for the last 22 years. We first met Lee and Brenda when, by happenstance, looked at a house they had put on the market in Bent Tree Place in 2000. During that visit, they mentioned that they had just purchased a lot across the street in Sheffield Park. And they were getting ready to build. That sounded like a great idea, so we drove across the street and decided to do the same. And as fate would have it, we bought, unknowingly I think, the lot next to theirs. They moved into their house in December of 2000 and we moved into ours a couple of months later. Since that time, Ann and I have probably spent over 500 evenings together with Lee and Brenda sharing meals and traveling throughout from Alaska to the Hill Country and almost everywhere in between. If I were to ask you to start listing the words that come to mind you'd attribute to Brenda, I'm sure they would be numerous. Words like loving, sincere, selfless, courage, courageous, 
giving, graceful, caring, refined, tasteful, elegant, thoughtful, sweet, positive, patriotic, curious, industrious, gardener, a great cook, strong sense of right and wrong, but not judgmental. Another word that might come to mind could be the word perfect, however we know. And she knew she was not perfect. But if you needed someone who loved and cared and nurtured her, her husband, Brenda was perfect for that. If you needed someone to love her children, Kristen, Stephen, and Meredith would probably say she was perfect for that. If you needed someone to love her sister, stand by her, support her, and be the rock of her life, Tony would say she was perfect for that. If you needed someone to love, encourage her grandchildren, be a part of their lives, attend ball games, recitals, and other activities, she was also perfect for that. There was a lot of love in Brenda, enough to go around for her family and also her many friends. I don't know of anyone who more exemplifies the biblical admonition of how to live one's life as it's written in Micah. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to act justly? Love mercy and walk humbly with your God. That was Brenda. And as I said, she was not perfect. So now I want everyone to come up with a list in your mind where she was not perfect. That's hard to do, isn't it? But there is one thing she was not perfect in, and she failed it miserably. Disorganization. <laughs> Everything had its place. Flatware in the drawer, not only in the correct grouping, but all the forks were stacked and the spoons were stacked perfectly on top of each other. Organization of spices and cooking utensils, refrigerator shelves, bookshelves, on and on. The garage could have been used as an operating room. All tools hanging in order, up off the bench, floor swept, even the trash cans were clean. Now this is in no way a reflection on Lee's acumen for grocery shopping. But I've seen the map of HEB drawn out with the major groupings listed by aisle where she would put checks by those areas whereby Lee could go directly to the appropriate area and quickly pick up the items on that week's grocery list. I especially love Brenda because she always laughed at my quips and flippant remarks. But most of all, she always took my side when I got after Lee. I was kind of an Eddie Haskell type, in that I could get Lee to say something that would get him into trouble. She would act, actually tuck up for me. Then she would say, Lee, you don't mean that. And then he would invariably say, yes, I do and then she'd apologize to, for him. She was amazing in that she could see a plant arrangement in a magazine and then head to the nursery and replicate it, and it looked better than the original. Or she would get interested in various things and even take classes in it like woodworking and basket weaving as well as fly fishing. Right, Chad? And if you ever saw her cook, her making an apple pie was like watching a sculptor. Each apple slice was cut to the perfect size, and if the recipe required two types of apples, she would have the exact same number of slices of each. Her salads were perfect in every way. The strawberries were sliced or cupped perfectly and combined with blueberries and mandarin oranges and roasted sugared pecans. I shall miss that. I won't forget the day, Friday. I stopped by the hospital on my way home to visit Lee and Brenda. She had just gone in for the second time, and I guess we just didn't know how serious as it obviously was. I got up to the ICU room, and Lee stepped out and told me what the prognosis was. I was speechless. I could not imagine what was going through Lee's mind at that moment. 
I had a brief, and after a brief reflection, my mother's gene kicked in and I just stood there with Lee. I then went into the room and Brenda was calm and at best, the best word I could come up with, she seemed secure. And through the last few, through few weeks, she has epitomized several verses of scripture that we are all familiar with. And pastor, I hope I don't overlap too much. But I believe Brenda's security was due to her believing every one of these. The Bible says in 1 John that there is no fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. And John, it also says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe, believe in me also. And also in this world you shall have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And in Ecclesiastes, the familiar scripture that seemingly becomes more real as we get older. There is a time for every event under heaven. Time to give birth and a time to die. Time to weep and a time to laugh and a time to mourn and a time to dance. And I believe Brenda's dancing right now. And finally in Revelation, as Brenda is now in the presence of the Lord, it says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have all passed away. And on that Tuesday at six o'clock, she heard those most wonderful words very clearly. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share the joy of your master. Thank you.
Thank you, Alan. That was beautiful. And Susan as well, and, and Keith and, and Mike. Those are beautiful words for our day to day. We celebrate as you shared words of life with us. And Ann always does beautifully with that beautiful song that is a gift from Brenda to each of us today that God speaks to us through her words. I want you to hear these things, and we'll share some here in just a minute. But uh, of course, I've known Lee for 25 years now, and Brenda as well. and. Uh, some have longer relationships as family, and she loved each of you. Uh, she'll be glad you're here to celebrate her life and new beginnings in this day. And of course, Lee, you were the head usher here for a long, long time, right there in that center for you. Sit there uh, as a Marine should and listen to half my sermon, maybe not even half my sermon. You'd be there and call me Admiral always. I call you General. I was in the Navy, he was in the Marine. Same thing, but they don't know that yeah, if you're a Marine. But of course, it's special days, and, and she'd be waiting over there for you. Uh, you finally convinced her you could retire, and she said these words to me, I can sit with Lee again in church. <laughs> she was so glad you could be together. But she always waited, and uh, she's waiting again. But not in a hard pew, listen to a boring sermon. Uh, she is in a place called heaven. So we celebrate even our loss that she is in the place God designed for her, and we love those words. John 14, we know the words well. They go like this. To fearful disciples like us, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe you believe in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. There's a place for you. When the body fails, I've got a place for you. When the heart stops beating, I've got a place for you. You can't breathe. I've got a place where the breath of God is always, always there. That's the word Yahweh, by the way. The very breath of God is her gift in this uh, day of celebration of life. I love talking about how God takes fear away from us in death because we have a promise of a place. Uh, Christ said, I've got a place for you. Now we know that God made the universe. A God who can fling galaxies in space is a pretty big God. And God in seven days made the universe that we can see getting bigger every day with the Hubble telescope and the Webb telescope, bigger and bigger every day. It's a huge universe, beautiful, spectacular. Then God made a planet, put life on a planet. In seven days, he did all of that. Just let me create, create. And then the seventh day, the Bible says God rested. Well, he was simply done. He finished. And Jesus said these words to us. He said, I'm going to go and get a place ready for you that where I am, you can be also, and when you're ready for the place, I come to where you are, I will take you to that place. And that place, he said, I'm going to work on it. For 2,000 years, I've been working on a place called heaven. It might be pretty spectacular. It might be the right place, the God, place God wants for all of us. So we celebrate that promise of life for her as we know we are sad in our own losses of who she was. I will tell the family and friends, great job. You know, she was one to get things done, one to accomplish, one to succeed, one to overcome. Uh, in, in her words, when a door was shut, she knew God had another one to open for her. She'd go right through it. That was her life. Lee even shared these words with me. She, she knew this body was going to fail. Hospice is a glorious and sad word as well. And she just said, I'm going to just get that done. I'm going to take care of this, and she always did. So we celebrate that promise of life for all of us and, and that we know that promise is real. It's always about life. So we talk about what that looks like. And of course, the Bible speaks about her life in lots of ways. But of course, it was great to be her pastor. Uh, she was easy to pastor, always quiet, very strong, always quiet, always in her place. So we talk about who she is, what she did, and, and what that means for all of us in this very sacred day. And, I want to say to the family again, and friends, great job through all this. Clearly that you loved her, and after all that she accomplished in life, in these last days, she could lean into your love for her. They're going to take care of me. They're going to make sure it's okay. I can relax now into their love for me and their care for me. Those are important words. Of course, I've known her for a long time, and you and, and uh, Brenda met in New Horizons class here over 30 years ago right here in this church, and fell in love, and uh, she came into your room before, you know, you were actually married, you were engaged, and said these words of faith to you and hope, and she said, you know, I have cancer, it just came, I've got breast cancer, and, and she said, we can just lay all this down, don't worry about this, we'll just call it off, and the word was, not in a million years. What a great 30 years you've had. 
came to my office uh, years after that saying the cancer is back and said, will you just pray for me? She didn't ask for a lot of words, not a lot of therapeutic counseling. I'm not good at that anyway. She said, just pray for me. Told me later I knew that God was with me and that it was going to be okay. So we talk about that promise of faith that was hers, that she had this great faith and knew it was going to be all right. And that's a word of faith for all of us that God speaks in those days and a close family. She had a a special faith. We talked about her house as well, and we have a Bible study we've done for years uh, with our family and friends, and, and you and, and Brenda were part of that Bible study. I finally went to her home and thought, what a beautiful place. Unlike my house, she made a place for you in that house. There was all your things you had put together, and she just loved you that much to make sure you had a place in that perfect home. If you've been there, it is a perfect house. I made this great chicken salad sandwich. Uh, I still want some today. And just was a giver and could do anything. So we celebrate her accomplishments in life and the real things. And, and she knew the Bible, spoke words of faith, always shared words of faith. And, and, and when I saw her in the hospital, like many of us, you, you did in ICU, and I didn't know at that time how sick she was because she came to a church service I had right before that. She seemed fine at that point. And, and uh, she was very sick. I didn't know how sick she was in ICU. And she said, I have this lung disorder from my chemotherapy from years ago. It, it, it created this lung disorder. And she said these words to me, it was just me and her for that time before I pray, it's not going to get better, is what she said. But she said, I'm not afraid. For all of us, we have that gift from Brenda, I'm not afraid. I know where I'm going. I know what God's doing. God's here somewhere. If this door shuts, he'll open another one like he always has. Those are words of faith for all of us. And, and I love your fun stories in your home. You know, I love this particular story about, you know, you know, Brenda's fairly quiet. You know, she's very strong. Uh, she had no fear. You knew where you stood with her always. She's very forthcoming and how she spoke her life and lived her life and high achiever in so many things that she did. But if things didn't go quite right, she had this look, this Brenda look. Now, you didn't want that look. I only got it when it, I got to noon. I'd see it sometimes over there in that part of the church. Hey, brother, it's past noon. You better stop talking. But you knew the look. And what I hear from your family is you straightened up and you flew right during those moments because you got the look. It was also like a great love for your family. And, and she loved each of you, the, her daughter and the grand kids. Uh, I think they called her grandmom, grandmommy, and she loved her grandkids. Just loved them. They were just part of her life, part of who she was. And, and we share that story in my family. I'm not sure I like my own kids till I had grandkids. I don't like my own kids like I like these grandkids. She loved you, shared the stories of life, and just celebrated that. Those are good news for her. And, and, and of course, in this family, she was the compass. Now you've got to step in and be a compass for Lee. He's not going to have one for a while. Lean into Lee for a time and say, let me be your compass, make sure it's okay. Because Lee's going to need that because she was a big strength for him. And that's how good marriages always are. So we celebrate that and she can find a silver lining in anything. And I saw that myself. This is pretty dark, but it's going to be okay. I lost my job. I'm going to get this. I was here. God's going to open a door. God always did as he did here. And she's waiting for us one more time today. Of course, in these days, she leaned into you, and that was a great gift to, to her as well, because she has had, had a great woman of faith as who she was, and, and no, no fears. You all saw that. She had this great faith. And she put her hand in the hand of Christ all those years ago, and he never turned her loose. She never turned him loose and walked hand in hand with the God who gave her life. And he shared the words, I got, I got a place ready for you, and when you're ready for this place, I come to where you are. And we know what he did. He called her name. She knew that voice, knew the name, stepped out, life for her, sad for us. That's a word of life. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4 speaks about what she had gone through. And I'll share this way from Paul the Apostle. He said, therefore, we do not lose heart. Words from her to you. Even though our outward person is perishing, and we saw that in the last few weeks. Yet the inward is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, he, he says, cancer and pain and all those things, just a light affliction is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But we do not look at the things which are seen, the things which are not seen, 
for the things which are seen are temporary, the things which are not seen are eternal. I encourage you to live in that for this moment. God, what we cannot see is more real than what we can see. So we see life here. We see light. We see the promise kept. That is Brenda's story. Outwardly, there were some dark moments, but inwardly, a great faith and a growing faith. So God speaks, and, and God's great work is done when this body fails. I put you where I want you, what I have for you. So we share the words again. Let not your heart be troubled. Lee, work on that. I will too. Grief is real. Don't be troubled by it. Be sad. Miss her, but not troubled. Separation and all this, you want to walk that path together. Because he said, where I am, I'm, you're going to be also. And she is there. Someday we'll see her again. I believe that. I believe that promise is real. Of course, uh, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I love the verse. It goes along with that song we just sung. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered in the heart of a person the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We can't see it, what she can see. But it's an amazing, glorious, 2,000-year preparation place. It's got to be something. Of course, I love Revelation chapter 21. Uh, it's a not yet for us, but this verse is a right now for Brenda. It's a word that God gives all of us that she is now living face to face through John about God's great gift. It says, God himself will be with them in a way he can't be with us because we're simply human flesh. We couldn't stand it. But she's now in God's presence in a body that she can handle this. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And we just shared those words. And Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 through 18, puts life to this. Fear not, I am the first and the last. The living one and I was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death. There's victory here in this promise that God has for us through Christ. That's why I love that vision in heaven of a God who can reach out, I'm not sure what God's hand looks like in heaven, but God reaches out and wipes a tear away. Let me ask you this about your own life. When's the last time anyone felt close enough to you to reach out and wipe a tear away? When has it happened for you? Maybe when a wife's heart is breaking, a husband might do that. Or when a child is crying, you might do that. It's that picture God gives us of reaching out to say, I will do this in the most intimate, close, personal life-changing way possible because genesis 3 things got all messed up but in revelation god said i'll put it back the way i want it and it's all about life so there's victory here and we hear the words we share the words <laughs> well done she's heard them you've been faithful and she has been to you to her family to her jobs whatever she wanted to do she was faithful and the promise is her faith today has intersected god's perfect faithfulness so we get it together now in the name of life and not of, not of death. But allow me to pray for a second. Heavenly Father, glad for this day, your promise of life. Speak to us now in this next song and the poem after that that Lee will share, that we'll see you, hear you, and respond to your good news of life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we have a song called How Great They Are. We'll get to sing it together. Amen. Before we sing, I just want to say a word of encouragement. And in times of grieving and in times of mourning, it is important to sing. It is important to sing the truth of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the truth that we have uh, just heard. And it's also important to sing to the Lord in worship and also to sing to one another the hope that we have in Jesus. So as we turn in our hymnals to hymn number 77, let us sing unto the Lord, and let us also specifically sing to Brenda's family this, this morning the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We will sing verses 1 and verse 4. Let's sing together. I 
I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art verse four when christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Song of Great Power, and Ali has a poem to share. You read that at your mother service, seemed like yesterday. Just words of faith for us to hear together. Lee, I'll stand with you. I asked the pastor to stand with me, and I, this is the first time a Navy guy has ever supported a Marine, so. If I'm going to take you to the battle, man. We're going to get you there. <laughs> so if I don't get through this, I want him to. to to, to back me up on this, as he always has. There's a tradition in the Fisher Mitchell, Mitchell families. For generations, there's a poem that's always been read at a funeral. And it seemed like lately I was the guy that was reading the poem. And so today I felt like I needed to read the poem for my wife. And it goes like this. When I come to the end of the road and the sun sets for me, I want no rights in gloom-filled rooms. Why cry for a soul set free? Miss me a little, but not too long, and not, for your, not with your head bowed low. Remember the love that we once shared. Miss me, but let me go. For this is a journey that we all must take, and for each must go alone. It's all a part of the master's plan, a step on the road to home. When you are lonely and sick at heart, Go to the friends you know and bear your sorrows in doing good deeds. Miss me, but let me go. I have one thing tonight. Give your wife, your girlfriend, your kids a hug and hug them because you can. And Brenda will be there with you tonight. And thank you again for being here. Great job, Maureen. There'll be a visitation time and a meal time in the uh, chapel, which is just right that direction here in a moment. The family will all see some of you in the four years are closed. Then a graveside at Prairie Hill at 2 p.m. this afternoon. You want to Google that, but it's about 25 minutes or so away. But great job, and great job in loving her and being faithful to her and always being with her. She never had any fears about you. When she would tell you what to do, you'd always do it, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, glad now for the day of grace, your spirit that has moved, your promise you have kept, and the life that we know is real in a place called heaven. Thank you for Brenda's life, the reason we have gathered which always points to you, 
to the comfort only you can give us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.